so as to induce all beings to increase in goodness and benefit by what they see or hear. These means are also of two kinds, namely, the direct, which enables one to get saved quickly, and the indirect, which enables one to get saved after a longer time. The direct and indirect means are again of two kinds, namely, the progressive practice and the final attainment. As to influences of the same spirit, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas desire to deliver all men from sorrow, and these spirits influence men constantly without ceasing, and they are of the same nature and wisdom and power, therefore manifest the same spirit in all their experience. This is experienced when men in their ecstasy are able to see the Buddhas. The difference between the influences of the true model is of two kinds. The first is the uncorresponding. It is that of the common man or of the two lower schools and first stages of the great school. These are influenced by their consciousness and impression, but are able to improve by means of the power of faith. They have not attained to that correspondence of mind with the Absolute whereby they are one with the nature of the true reality, and have not attained that experience which is natural and perfectly corresponding to the work of the true reality. The second is the corresponding. It is that of the perfected Buddhas who have attained to the state when their mind is not different from that of the true reality, but corresponding to the nature and work of all the Buddhas. In this state men are able to act naturally by means of the power of absolute spirituality, and by the influence of the absolute to put an end to ignorance. Next note the confused state. The influence of this confused state has been going on from eternity without ceasing, but when one reaches the state of Buddhahood this ceases. But the influence of the pure state has no end, it has an eternal future. It is the influence of the absolute reality. The confused idea is ended, and the spiritual is manifested in the influence it exerts on work, and has no end. As to the nature and state of the absolute, that of all common men, that of the lower school, that of the middle school, that of the advanced, and that of the Buddhas are without a difference, only having more or less of it. It is neither that which had an origin some time, nor that which will end at some time, it is really eternal. In its nature it is always full of all possibilities, and is described as of great light and wisdom, giving light to all things, real and knowing. Its true nature is that of a pure mind, eternally joyful, the true soul of things, pure, quiet, unchanged, therefore free, with fullness of virtues and attributes of Buddha more numerous than the sands of the Ganges divine, unending, unchanged, and unspeakable. It is most complete, without lacking anything, it is called the treasury or storehouse or womb of the Tathagata, and also the divine body of the Tathagata. Question 6. Now you have said above that the nature of the Absolute is the same in all beings and is apart from all forms, how is it that you speak of its nature as having all these different possibilities? Answer. Although real and possessing these possibilities, yet they are not different qualities, they are of one kind only, one absolute reality, there is a likeness in all the different manifestations, therefore they cannot be different. Again, how do we say that there is a difference? It is in relation to consciousness and the finite that this difference appears. And how does it appear? As regards the origin of all things there is but one mind, not an unenlightened mind conjecturing at things. But in the finite there are imperfect ideas. The unenlightened mind begins to think of the world around, and this we call ignorance. If this finite thought conjecturing at things had not arisen, there would have been great wisdom and light. When the human mind begins to see that there exists the unseen beyond, where the mind nature is independent of this seeing, then it finds that this unseen shines throughout the universe. If the mind is excited or prejudiced, the knowledge is not true knowledge. When it has not found its true nature, it is not eternal, not joyful, not the true soul of things, not pure, but is busy in decaying, and therefore not free, and thus full of confusion more numerous than the sands of the Ganges. On the other hand, if the mind is not excited or prejudiced by imperfect ideas, all sorts of pure possibilities more numerous than the sands of the Ganges are open to it. If in the human mind there arises an idea to be followed, it is because there is something lacking in the mind. 
Thus the incalculable possibilities of the pure absolute nature is that of the one mind. There is no need to think out any new idea. It is complete, and is called the divine state, the treasury, or storehouse, or womb of the Tathagata. As to the work of the true reality it is that which is in all the Buddhas and the Tathagata from that first moment of great love and desire to cultivate their own salvation and then to save others, to the time of their great vow to save all beings throughout all future endless kalpas. They regard all living beings as their own selves, though they are not the same in form, for in reality all living beings in themselves are manifestations of the absolute reality without any difference. Then with the aid of this great wisdom of the true reality they put an end to ignorance, they see the divine, and there arise naturally all sorts of unimaginable service like that of the absolute reality reaching everywhere. Yet these beings are not ordinary forms, for the Buddhas and the Tathagata are perfect embodiments of the divine. The chief thought is that they are not the ordinary ideas of the world, they are not ordinary workers, but such workers as influence or inspire people in their experiences, hence we say they are the work of the true reality. This spiritual work of the true reality is of two kinds. The first is dependent on the senses and on what the mind of the ordinary man and those of the two lower schools understand by them, hence this kind is called the common stage, as these people do not know that their work is the manifestation of their sensation, so regard it outwardly by color and size, but do not fully know. The second is dependent on the faculties. It is what all the bodhisattvas from the time they reach the first station till they reach the highest station have experienced, and is called the inspired stage. This stage has incalculable manifestations, these manifestations have incalculable states, and these states have incalculable blessings. The results of this stage have also all kinds of incalculable glories according to their manifestations. They are endless and infinite, without measure, ever present in their reactions, indestructible, and never lost. These blessings are the results of the perfect influences of the six means of salvation and of the transcendent influences of the absolute reality. Thus the bodhisattvas are full of immeasurable joy, hence they are called the inspired spirits. As to what common men see, it is only the rough outline. These men according to their observations see all sorts of different living creatures in the six kinds of beings, gods, men, asuras, devils, hungry ghosts, beasts, they have not attained the state of joy, hence they are called common spirits. As to what the bodhisattvas know from the beginning of their free ideas, and what begins to appear to them by full faith in the true model, they know some of its characteristics, and glory that they are ever-present, immeasurable, only manifest in the mind, and inseparable from the absolute reality. But these bodhisattvas still have some imperfect notions remaining, as they have not reached the full divine state. If they reach a purer state of mind, and if they progress till they have reached the utmost state, the inspired is seen to perfection. When they pass beyond the sense and faculties, there is no visible state, for the divine soul of all the Buddhas has no outward form by which they are to be seen. Question 7. If the divine spirit of all the Buddhas is separated from form, how can it manifest any forms? Answer. This divine soul is the essence of all form, therefore it can manifest itself in form. This is why we say mind and matter are eternally the same. As the essence of matter is wisdom, the essence of matter is without form and is called the embodiment of wisdom. As the manifested essence of wisdom is matter, it is called the all-pervading embodiment of wisdom. The unmanifested matter is without magnitude, according to the will. It can show itself throughout all the universe as the immeasurable bodhisattvas, immeasurable inspired spirits, immeasurable. 